Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's wonderful to be here. And thanks to each of the witnesses for being here today. We're grateful for your input and expertise. To state the obvious, there have been a lot of bad decisions made over the past four years by the current administration, which is why the American people decisively voted to put President Donald Trump back in the White House on November 5th. Some of the worst decisions made by President Biden and VP Harris have gone through the Department of Interior. They allowed our land management agencies to wreak havoc on our rural communities by locking up our land and resources and jeopardizing our livelihoods under the dictates of President Biden's radical 30 by 30 agenda. I just want to begin by expressing my gratitude to the American people for caring about our legacy industries, for caring about energy independence, and for caring about the rights of Americans to produce affordable and reliable energy for the world. I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify in support of my bill, the Expediting Appeals Review Act, or ERA, which provides an off-ramp for entities whose cases are pending before the Interior Board of Land Appeals, or IBLA. The IBLA is a regulatory constructed pseudo-judicial administrative court within the Department of Interior. It was created in 1971 and overseals the appeals of agency actions, including those from the Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, the Office of Natural Resources Revenue, and Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. As of right now, there are eight administrative judges appointed to the IBLA, four of which were appointed last year with over 600 appeals sitting in front of them and have been pending for the last five years. Most cases are not subject to a timeline, and for those that are, the IBLA typically, typically fails to rule, resulting in deemed, quote, wins for the department. As one can imagine, and in an administrative court created by the federal government, the record is usually heavily redacted, oftentimes excluding important testimony and records that would be favorable to the appellant. So, parties filing for an appeal end up sitting in a queue for years at a time, paying heavy legal fees for nothing to get done, only for a decision to finally be made against them before they can finally go to an actual court to have their case heard. My bill allows appellants the opportunity to file a notice requesting an expedited appeal. If such a notice is filed seeking IBLA review, the case then has six months to be resolved. If the secretary fails to comply, the case is automatically decided in the government's favor, but no deference is given to the decision. In other words, it makes the decision irrelevant. So there's no incentive for the secretary to sit on his or her hands and continue to do nothing. The appealing party is then given the opportunity to proceed to district court to have their case heard before a more neutral arbiter. Importantly, it also allows those who wish to have their cases remain before the IBLA to do so if they so choose. The industries who have borne the brunt of the bad decisions made over the last four years have spoken in strong support of my bill, including the National Mining Association, the U.S. Oil and Gas Association, the Independent Petroleum Association of America, ConocoPhillips, and the American Petroleum Institute. Again, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here today to testify on this important bill, and I just want to thank all of those who have supported the crafting of this legislation, and specifically thank Mr. Travis for being here today to testify in support as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, um, Mr. Travis, listening to you talk about the IBLA and the information that I have practicing in that area. It reminds me of the book by Franz Kafka, The Trial. You just never know when you're going to be able to make it through the Leviathan of that process that's there. Uh, Mr. Whiteclay, I'm looking forward to the excitement of the development that you're looking at. Coal is the energy of the future. And I think that this is a fabulous opportunity for your tribe. So I want to thank Mr. Zinke for the work that he's done on that bill, that the important bill for, for your tribe and your tribal members. Um, Mr. Travis, thank you so much for being here and for being so supportive of this important legislation. I know that you've had to work with a lot of people whose cases have been stuck in front of the IBLA at their expense, and I appreciate the good work you've been doing on this, and we're grateful to have you here today. Have your clients had to pay significant legal fees while they wait for their cases to be taken up? And what have you observed regarding the personal and financial cost of the IBLA's broken process? 
Yes, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, legal fees are expensive, especially when you're talking about a minimum of three years that you're before uh, before they have an IBLA before you get uh, before you can get out to district court. So yes, the legal fees are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dollars, uh, and folks are just stuck in that process. And there's no consequence, no accountability from the agency itself for forcing people into that kind of a, a, a never-ending doom loop, is there? No, and we've actually gotten uh, documentation from the agency that that's one of their strategies. So the agency will say, let's just get this, let's make a decision, because we know when they get to IBLA, it'll be stuck there for three years and they won't get a decision. So agencies use that. Wow, what a broken process. What an absolute broken process. And so contrary to our form of government. Uh, the IBLA claims to resolve a significant number of cases each, each year, about 270, which would be about two, 22 cases per month, uh, and according to your testimony, but is the IBLA misleading people regarding these claims, and if so, how are they doing that? Yeah, I think there's a distinction to be made there between resolving claims and deciding claims on the merits. So as I mentioned, the IBLA has over 600 cases before it. They decided just 36 on merits. So uh, if they were to decide all the cases on the merits, we're looking at about 20 years to get out of that process. Uh, the cases that you mentioned that they decide, that, that 200 number, uh, are on technicalities, on things like not filing in time, not paying a fee in time, things like that, not on the actual merits of a case. So it sounds like we've got a lot of problems with the IBLA, and my bill is to address some of them specifically related to the time constraint. Are there other ways in which we need to try to fix the ABLA if it's actually going to be a functioning uh, adjudicatory body? Yeah, I think, I think any time you've got a body that is statutorily constructed instead of uh, uh, through the normal legal process, you're going to have problems. Um, it, you know, essentially, you're, you're hoping that an uh, agency created by the government is going to rule fairly between the government and another party. And so I do think broad reform is needed there across the board. So my experience has been with ALJs as well, uh, and the SEC and FTC are two agencies that are very abusive in terms of using ALJs. I think that they have a 95% plus success rate in front of their uh, independent ALJs, while maybe a 60 to 65% success rate in front of an Article III court. And I think you really just hit the nail on the head. Sometimes we look at reform and we think that we can fix this, but the reality is, is that these uh, supposedly intentionally independent agencies or appellate adjudicatory bodies are actually extremely biased towards the agency that they allegedly oversee. Isn't that true? Yeah, I think so, and I think we see that not just in federal government, but in state government as well. Uh, I mean, I can tell you my experience in practicing in the other states is uh, between before an ALJ, you're likely to lose 90 plus percent of the time. That's right. Uh, when you actually get to court, if you get a fair shake at a novo review, your odds are 50-50. So j just going back to the brass tacks of what that means is that the IBLA and these uh, ALJs really are a violation of the fundamental constitutional right to due process because you're not getting due process. You're t having to take your appeal to the very agency uh, that made the decision in the first place. And I think that this uh, speaks to a broader issue in terms of regulatory reform across the board, which is getting quite a bit of airplay since the election. But the reality is, is that we've stacked the deck against the citizens and businesses of this country, and we've stacked it in favor of a federal government that's too powerful, too big, too expensive, uh, too much willing to go into debt, and too ready to, to do the kind of, of deficit spending that we've seen over the last 20 years especially. So I, uh, I think this is an important discussion. This bill is an important first start. Thank you for being here to testify on it, and with that, I yield back.